and sunbreak. As you visit this place for the first time, you're welcomed by the breathtaking view of the clear blue skies, the huge frozen mountains that surround the land, and a vast array of environments that add beauty to the scenery. While everything about this place makes it seem like an ideal spot to settle in, it once was for the people that used to live here. Many, many years ago, the citadel stood as a bustling city, constructed by a prosperous kingdom. Originally, it served as an outpost established by the maritime fleet of the kingdom. Eventually, the population in the area grew as more and more individuals settled in. However, 50 years ago, the thriving city was plunged into chaos. One night, a lot of the monsters came in, attacking the walls and destroying the once thriving city. Everyone living in the area was caught by surprise. It was a sudden onslaught. In the darkness, they all screamed in panic as they all tried to escape. Some of the knights that live in the city stood strong and tried to protect the place. However, as they tried to defend the place, they were all slaughtered one by one. Eventually, the knights fell and the people in the city had no option but to abandon their beloved home. It was horrific. A story passed down through generations by those fortunate enough to escape the ruined city. And now, I'm about to share with you the full story of the Fallen Kingdom in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Our story begins after one odd morning in Kamura village. We have received a letter from an unfamiliar kingdom. After reading the contents of the letter, we remembered one kingdom mentioned by our dear friend, Rondine. With no time to waste, we decided to look for her and ask her about the letter. While looking around the village, we found Rondine at the entrance of Kamura. She stood there as if she had anticipated our arrival. We then approached her. Ah, Hunter, I was waiting for your return. I have received a letter from my home country that contains somewhat troubling news. The letter was sent by my sister, and in it she details how monsters from the kingdom have started invading neighboring territories. My sister belongs to the Knights of the Royal Order and has assembled a research team to combat this threat. Ideally, the research team would halt their advance before the village, but it's only a matter of time before some of these monsters reach Kimura's shores, if they have not already. Elder Fugan has already been brought up to speed. However, as you are the defender of this village, I would like you to be a part of the discussion of this matter. Come. Let us go speak with Elder Fugan. There isn't a moment to waste. Rondine was worried about the letter, which is quite rare considering she's quiet about her homeland. In Kamura, she's renowned as a merchant dealing in exotic goods from distant lands. She can be found at the docks of the Body Plaza. As we meet her for the first time, it is clear how Rondine came from distant lands. Her elegant attire and graceful demeanor sets her apart from the typical merchant in Kamura. As we get to know more about Rondine, we had sensed her hiding a secret from us. Perhaps it is because I'm foreign, but the children of the village seem to enjoy coming to pay me a visit. Except the other day, the children told me, You don't look like a merchant. Hmm, that simply doesn't make sense. This merchant disguise should be infallible. Uh... <laughs> I am teasing. Yes! Teasing! I am but a regular seafaring trader. Certainly not a hunter. It took a while to get to know Rondine. But once we got acquainted with her, she opened up a bit about her past. 
My identity as a traitor is but a facade. In truth, I am a knight of my kingdom, sent to Kimura by my queen's order. Of course, the knight is merely a name for hunters who serve her majesty. It means little else. Rundine came from afar and was ordered to bring the blacksmith of Kimura back to her kingdom to negotiate the blacksmith's exceptional skills. I've concluded that negotiating under false pretenses was dishonorable. So, I've decided that we will return with the technology only with Kimura's blessing. Until then, I am but a trader. In the middle of Komura village, we saw Elder Fugen and Master Utsushi. There you are, Squirt. We've been waiting for you. Elder Fugen, the trusted leader of Komura, an unshakable pillar during the monster's rampage attacks. All right, Utsushi. Fill us in. Master Utsushi, a man you'll find at the gathering hub. He guides young hunters and oversees arena quests. I'm sure you already heard the not-so-gnarly news from Brondine. Monsters from the kingdom are starting to invade other territories, and looks like Kimura has made the list of other territories. Despite Kimura's previous encounter with the Rampage, which I'll share more in another video, the village was about to face a new threat. An unusual monster was already seen nearby Kimura. We just received word that a daimyo hermitar has been spotted in the shrine ruins. That's a first for this region. Merciful heavens! We're already too late! To think the turmoil of my homeland would jeopardize the safety of this village. How can I even begin to apologize? Because of this, Elder Fugen had tasked us to defeat the approaching monster to protect the village. At any rate, Squirt. We're gonna need you to give our guest in the Shrine Ruins a proper Kamura welcome. Minoto has the job lined up for you. Utsushi, you've got your own mission. And Rondin, let us know next time you hear from the research team. Now, go get to it. We entered the gathering hall and met up with Minoto to take on the urgent quest. We went off to the Shrine Ruins and found the invading monster. After a long hunt, we successfully captured the monster. On our way back to Komuro, while we were having a chat with Master Utsushi, suddenly, a monster's body unexpectedly crashed into the cart, catching everyone off guard. Something wrong? Everyone was confused as to what had happened. As we looked around, an unfamiliar creature was lurking nearby the area, hidden from sight. Hey, hold up! Before he could act, an unknown hunter appeared out of nowhere, swiftly intervening to save him. The mysterious hunter bravely confronted the monster. Leave the beast to me. This is a royal matter. But despite her efforts, the monster managed to slip away, escaping into the darkness. Once we had returned to Komura, we regrouped at the center of the village. Elder Fugen asks the unknown hunter to introduce herself to the group. In any case, we appreciate the backup. So, you're Rondine's sister, huh? Yes, Honorable Elder. Dame Fiorine, Knight of the Royal Order, at your service. As the conversation went on, 
Elder Fugan began to share what had happened 50 years ago. Most of the villagers aren't aware of this, but 50 years ago, the kingdom suffered its own calamity. You see, this massive hole opened up far away from Kimura, in a coastal region right outside the kingdom's domain. Because of its proximity, it fell under royal jurisdiction. But there was another reason why the kingdom got involved. According to Furian, the kingdom got involved because a similar phenomenon happened many centuries ago within the capital. The ground's disturbance led to an arise of an elder dragon named Malzeno, causing chaos to the kingdom's existence. Following the destruction, the monster suddenly vanished. However, 50 years ago, history repeated itself. Another catastrophic event occurred with the formation of a new crater. Malzeno reappeared, bringing chaos once more, only to vanish afterwards. But to remain unknown. Fearing its return, the Royal Order established an outpost in an old fort to monitor the crater. However, in light of recent events, construction has begun to rebuild the fort. We've even given it a proper name. Elgado. A grand name, is it not? Elder Fugan asked a question of whether the recent behavior of the monsters is linked to the potential return of Malzeno. Too soon to say. The crater shows no signs of activity. Still, that hypothesis is the basis of our team's expedition. We knights vow to protect our fair kingdom from any threat. If it has returned, we shall lay down our lives for the cause. Because of the situation, Elder Fugan had asked us to help Furin and the kingdom. Furin expressed gratitude as she heard the news. Oh, you, you're sending Kimura's hunter to the kingdom. We are in your debt. As a knight of the order, I must show my respect and gratitude for the Elder's decision to lend us your strength. I pray that the flame of Kimura will prove to be the light of hope that the kingdom needs. But do take care of yourself. And my sister. Well then, call upon me once your preparations are complete. It was daytime. The seas were calm and the skies were clear. We set sail on the boat together with Furian, and we were on our way to the outpost. We shall be in port soon. This is our outpost, Elgado. Not long after, we have reached our destination, Elgado, a faraway outpost in the land known as the Kingdom, home to the research team whose main goal is to solve the mystery surrounding the hunting elder dragon Malzeno and other monsters roaming the Kingdom. The outpost holds a wide variety of skilled and hardworking people, from Knights of the Royal Order to researchers, sailors and traders, and hired hunters. Due to its dual nature as a trading port and research outpost, it's outfitted with all the necessary resources for enterprising hunters. Well, what do you think? As we arrived safely at Elgado, Furin introduced us to the entire team working at the outpost. Admiral Gallius, the leader of the Knights of the Royal Order and the commanding officer at Elgado's outpost. Though a man of a few words, his dignified presence and an unwavering leadership abilities have earned him the stalwart trust of the Royal Order and the citizens of the kingdom. Furin, the de facto leader of the Knights of the Royal Order. Together with Admiral Gallius, she helps lead the research team's investigations into the mystery surrounding the kingdom's monsters. Imbued with a strong sense of responsibility and a penchant for overseriousness, she's known to resort to heavy-handed measures to accomplish her mission occasionally. There are other people in Elgado that play an important role in helping the kingdom. To start with, 
I recommend exploring the outpost. Get to know Elgado's people and its facilities. We have Minil, Elgado's skilled blacksmith, and we also have Oboro, the Wyverian merchant of Elgado. Besides these people, Furane had asked us to meet up with a particular person called Master Arlo. Master Arlo, our advisor. He's been prodding me for a change to meet you. Literally. And I hear he has another visitor from Kumura as well. Though I've no idea who it is. After talking to Admiral Gallius and Furane, we went off to meet Master Arlo. And here you are at last. Kamora Village's ultimate hunter. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. I was expecting you to be some kind of muscle-bound goon, yeah? But you've got the eyes of a level-headed hunter. No wonder you're so beloved back home. Master Arlo, the chief hunting tactics instructor and the arena quest handler of the Elgado outpost, a man who trains knights of the royal order. It is said that Furain and her sister Rondine have also trained under his guidance. Admiral Gallius has been a friend of his since childhood, and despite their very contrasting personality, they get along very well. While getting to know Master Arlo, he called his friend Master Utsushi, who's been keeping track of us since we left Kamura. Ah, oh, shurikens, you knew I was up there. Wouldn't expect anything less from a knight of the royal order. Be down in a sec, and uh, no cahoots, okay? As Utsushi came down from the rooftop, he then asked if we have seen the giant crater that lies beside Elgado. As mentioned earlier, this huge crater is one of the many craters that came out years ago. Massive, innit? You know, there's a lot of people in the kingdom that say the same thing. Some even say it's like the sun fell out of the sky. After a while, Master Arlo pointed out the person in charge of the quests at Elgado. Oh, one more thing. It's about the last in charge of the quests here in Elgado. That's her over there. Princess Chiche. Finding that princess bit hard to swallow, yeah? Trust me, the little miss is our princess. Oi, right, don't give me that look. I'm telling the truth. That girl over there is heiress to the throne. She didn't want to be locked up in the castle while everyone was out risking their lives. So she became a quest receptionist. She'll tell you everything you need to know about your assignments. Should have training quests for you too. Just watch how you talk to her, yeah? After our conversation with Master Arlo, we moved on and met with Chiche at the quest receptionist area. You must be Master Hunter. Lady Fiorain's told me so much about you. I'm Chite. I've been given the great responsibility of handling all the quests here in Elgado Outpost. Chiche, Elgado's outpost quest receptionist. It's been said that she's the princess of the kingdom. Despite her higher role, she decides to take on the duty of a quest receptionist and support everyone at Elgado. Because of her diligence towards her work, she became a beacon of strength for the knights that are stationed in the outpost. Moreover, Chiche shared their goal of defeating Malzeno after it had terrorized the kingdom for such a long time. It was their top priority, alongside with their other goals of stopping the monsters of the kingdom from invading other nearby territories. After meeting with Chiche, we embarked on a few quests in the jungle area. Jungle is a warm locale that rains quite often. The place is filled with rich, tree-laden greenery, expansive underground caverns, and relaxing water slide areas. You know, describing this place makes it sound like a paradise to relax. However, let's not forget that dangerous monsters lurk in this place. Not only that, but as you continue to explore the areas of the jungle, You'll see temple-like structures and many other ruins scattered across the water. The jungle locale has its own mystery on what kind of civilization used to be here. But that's for another video, so do subscribe if you don't want to miss it. As we continue completing each of the quests assigned on Elgado, such as slaying the Tetranodon to open the pathway for Elgado and Kumura to trade, and stopping a subspecies of Pishaten from invading other territories. Furin had some important news to share back at the outpost. There's a slightly eccentric scientist on the investigation team. He's following the trail of one of the three lords in the flooded forest. However, it seems that while tracking the three lords, Another monster was tracking him. 
curiosity gets the better of him. And when he's focused on his research, he's blind to everything around him. He's not in any immediate danger. Surprisingly fleet-footed for someone who doesn't get much exercise. The only problem is that, without him, all of our investigations cannot proceed. Furion worries about the safety of the scientist on the investigation team and wants us to help him. Without any time to waste, we took on the quest to hunt the Anjanath in the flooded forest. After successfully hunting Anjanath in the flooded forest, we found the scientist conducting his research. Sent to help? Ha. The name's Bahari, gadget expert and researcher extraordinaire. Anyway, Garingom aren't known for leaving their territory. Something weird is going on. Huh. Guess I gotta start investigating, huh? I'd love to head back to the outpost with you, but I need to take care of some things here first. As we returned to Elgado and reunited with Furane and Admiral Gallius, we began to discuss the current progress of locating the three lords. Now then, the Garangolm Bahari mentioned is, in fact, one of the three lords we're looking for. He must have a good reason for wanting to stay out in the field. I just hope he understands the danger he's put himself in. After successfully hunting down the remaining invading monsters in each of the location, another urgent quest came along. There you are. We've just had an urgent report from Bahari. After wading through reams of irrelevant drivel, I've worked out that he's found the Garangolm and is now in pursuit. It's attacking nearby settlements, so we must act fast. The crucial question is, why have these monsters suddenly begun to expand into new territory? Unlike the previous urgent quest, Furane decided to join with us as we were about to face one of the three lords. I'll once again be accompanying you. As a knight of the Order, I won't have you going after one of the three lords alone. Before we took on the urgent quest, Chiche warned us about the dangers of facing a Garongong and she gave us a heads up about the challenging location we were about to enter. At last, it's time to face one of the three lords. Oh, Hunter, how brave you are to face the Garangolm. Are you not scared? Our knights have been struggling against its massive bulk and powerful attacks. Be careful, won't you? Setting out on the quest, we sailed towards an unexplored locale, the Fortress of Turmoil. Citadel. It was daytime, and the skies were clear as we entered Citadel. Our hunting camp was set safely outside the dock, alongside the supply box. As we look behind the dock, a large ruined structure can be seen off the shore. In front of our camp, lies a stone wall. These walls would serve as a little protection for our camp. And in that stone wall, there's also a small gap. Fortunately, the size was enough for us to fit through. As we went inside, we were greeted by the breathtaking view of the clear blue sky. This place looks amazing. As we continue to see these large ruined structures, it's hard not to think about what had happened in this place before. As we further explore Citadel in search of Garangom, we begin to see the vast array of environments that inhabit the locale. 
If we take a look at the map of Citadel, as we navigate to the west of Citadel, we see the forest and hills. The trees scattered all around this area are filled with tree saps. Some even have hardened. These trees would contain an abundant amount of tree sap, which leads to some of it leaking out in some of the areas and forming a huge pool of sticky swamp. If we continue to explore deep within the forest, the green hue of the land begins to change. Almost as if the land was tainted with something, the leaves look dry while some of the trees don't have anything left in their branches. As we take a closer look, these trees are filled with poisonous sap. Apparently, 50 years ago, a poisonous monster had died in this area, and because of it, the monster's body had served as a nourishment, causing it to produce the poisonous sap we see today. As we navigate through the north of Citadel, we get to see the frozen mountains. The place is dangerously cold in this area of the Citadel. Because of the insanely high freezing temperature, huge shards of ice begin to form. And if we continue to explore these mountains, some of the ruined structures can be seen frozen deep within the hard ice. Moreover, some of these ruins are exposed to the higher parts of the frozen mountain. From the distance, in one of the ruined structures, we can see the kingdom's flag that's been torn being blown by the cold wind. Discovering these fallen structures while standing in the cold wind just makes you think how terrifying the people of Citadel must have faced to see this kind of destruction. And as we continue to explore alongside the east of Citadel, from the distance, we see a long bridge that leads to the castle gates. In front of the castle gates, there are two Dragonators. One of them is damaged. Above the Dragonators, we see the old, worn-out flag of the kingdom. It signifies the state of the place, long abandoned. Many of the buildings and houses built by the people of Citadel can be seen inside the ruined castle. Some of these ruined structures are still standing, while some have already turned into rubble. As we continue to explore the land of Citadel, there are left out notes scattered all over their place. After gathering all these messages, each of the notes share a haunting story from a knight who once lived here in Citadel. I am a knight who swore loyalty to the kingdom. These are the final memories of this town and my best friend. This town was built around a citadel. The guards here had nothing to stave off but the cold. It was peaceful but dull. However, this led to a lack of vigilance, causing us to overlook the beginnings of a tiny anomaly. The creatures living near the city suddenly became violent. At first only a few, but every day there were more. And then one night, monsters began attacking sieging the walls and destroying the town and the citadel. We were all caught off guard. The townsfolk panicked in the dark and ran to escape. It was pure pandemonium. My fellow knights were slaughtered one by one. One of the monsters was unlike anything I've seen before. But its appearance reminded me of the dragon of the old legends, Malzino. I was paralyzed with fear. It was then that I noticed a young boy squirming for his life underneath the dragon's claws. My brave friend slashed at the beast to protect the boy, but he hardly made a scratch. He urged me to flee with the child. I took the boy's hand and escaped the ruins of the city as my friend fought Malzino. In the distance, the sun started to rise. After tirelessly exploring the areas of Citadel, we discovered the monster, Garangom. Garangom is one of the three lords. It's known as the honking beast of nature, or the forest guardian of Citadel. This monster has bumpy scales and uneven shells all over its body. Its scales are tough because they're made of the mixed plant juices and sap. Even though the monster is big and scary looking, 
it stands out among other monsters for its odd behavior. Surprisingly, it's quite shy and tends to stay away from others, preferring its own company. Due to recent events, Garangom has gone berserk, wandering beyond its usual territory and even reaching to human settlements. Because of this, we had to slay the monster. After we have defeated the monster, we continue to explore the citadel for quite a bit, looking for more clues. It may not be much, but at least we have some clues to go on. While we were searching for more clues, a strong wind passed by in the forest. Red bat like creatures began to fly over the area. The night was odd, and we headed back to Elgado. We met up with everyone at Elgado to discuss about Garangom. After a lengthy discussion, Bahari plans to analyze Garangom further to see if he can find more clues. After helping Elgado for quite a while, Bahari called for another meeting to talk about his findings. The wounds were like bite marks, made by a much smaller creature. But I can't identify them. Their shape and chemistry don't match anything on record. See where I'm going here? Furane suggests that it could be from the strange flying creatures that we have encountered a while back. That's right! It's just a hypothesis. But I'm thinking they somehow influenced that Garangom's aggressiveness. After talking with the group, Bahari had named the flying small red creatures Curio. Moving on with the investigation into the strange bite marks on Garangom. The team decided to capture some curio to gain a better understanding of the creature. Fortunately, we found these creatures in the Frost Islands. However, it wasn't the only one there. Another dangerous monster was lurking in the area. Aurora Somnacanth, a monster subspecies of Somnacanths. This monster was said to live in colder regions unlike the usual species that emit a sleeping mist. Not for long, we eventually slayed the lurking monster and captured a few curios for Bahari's research. Eventually, we would get another urgent quest from the team. This time, we managed to track down the second lord of the kingdom. A lunar garren's been spotted. We must deal with it at once. And guess what? Curio have been spotted there too. Maybe it is the Curio that are causing these monsters to act this way. Bahari, was it not Morzino that we believed was the driving force behind all of this chaos? Because the way you're talking now makes it sound as if Quirio are the cause. Bahari continues to think about how the Curio creatures are connected to the ongoing situation. However, Bahari is still convinced the Elder Dragon, Malzano, is still behind all the chaos. But the Quirio are somehow involved. Is that what you're saying? Yes. They might not be the whole story, but they're in there somewhere. And I'm starting to see how they fit in. I think. But I need more to go on. Hunter, Fiore, take care of the Lunar Garret. And yes, Bahari, get your suckers. All of you, be careful. Luna Garen, a monster that's known by many names throughout the kingdom. Luna Garen is a massive wolf-like creature adorned in sturdy cobalt scales outlined in white. When it gets furious, it rises its hind legs resembling a werewolf. Its body and claws are covered in eye spikes fortifying its defense and making its attacks deadly. It was a battle under the full moon at Citadel. However, shortly after, we defeated Lunagarin. Would you look at that? <laughs> Could you not have waited for our return at least? Bahari, your test will have to wait. What? Why?
During the meeting with our team, Bahari asks about Fiorin's condition. Theo, you sure you're okay? You weren't hurt too badly, were you? It's nothing, really. A minor flesh wound. I promised the Admiral I would behave myself. It's just a scratch and it hardly even hurts anymore. I'll have no trouble continuing my duty. As the meeting continued, Bahari and Furin share their thoughts about the Curio creatures and their influence on the monster's aggression. Molzino has been using the Curio to drive other monsters into this hyper-aggressive state. Why? We do not know yet. But at least now there's a clear link between the aggressive monster behavior, Molzino, and the Curio. And we got to thank you, Hunter. We'd never have come this far without your help. Admiral Gallius was taken aback by this information, as there hasn't been any recorded sightings of their Curio alongside Malzeno for quite a while. Bahari, there's no record of Curio being seen with Malzeno. Bahari continues to question why Malzeno uses the Curio creatures. He suggests to the team that they all try to figure it out before even encountering Malzeno. We met up with Chiche, and she was glad to hear that we were all safe after getting attacked by Malzeno. Welcome back, Hunter. I'm so glad you're safe. When I heard that you had been attacked by Malzeno, I nearly fainted. So it's such a relief to see you safe. Fearane's lucky to have not been seriously injured. Thank goodness. Hmm. Let's do our best. I got it. Good. I'm okay. The research team has returned. I must go. Fearing! Hey! Someone get help! Fearin fell ill and collapsed onto the ground. The incident steered concern among everyone at Elgado. We met up with Admiral Gallius and Bahari to discuss about Furin's condition. Admiral Gallius asked Bahari whether Furin's condition was the result of the wound inflicted by Malseno. Well, not so much the wound itself. It's what's inside. Poison, to be specific. If she's not responding to treatment, it's no ordinary poison. Bahari mentions, after examining Furin, he discovered a substance that was almost identical to the one he extracted from the fangs of Curio. The very same substance that's been making monsters go berserk. This is the root cause of this whole disaster. And that raises a question, doesn't it? You know what I'm talking about, right, Hunter? Why did I find Curio poison in a wound inflicted by Malzino? The answer's simple. Malzino's body is coursing with Curio juice. But for some reason, it doesn't turn Mal crazy. It only makes it stronger. And that just gives the Curio more to feed on. They're parasites living off Malzino. It's win-win. In other words, it's symbiosis. Malzino and the Curio are both using each other. Bahari finally understood the connection between the two creatures and how it answers the sudden behavior of the monsters thanks to Furane's wounds. However, it didn't end there. The team began to plan on what they could do to save Furin. Luckily, Bahari remembered a Wyvarian doctor named Tadori. Years ago, when Malzino decimated the kingdom, a terrible plague followed. Dr. Tadori was able to develop a treatment that saved countless lives. Now he mostly spends his time out in the field, and he travels around so much that no one really knows where to find him. Bahari mentions Tadori has a friend back in Kamura named Kagero, who could know something about Tadori's whereabouts. With no time to waste, we traveled back to Kamura village to visit Kagero and ask about Dr. Tadori. Welcome home, hunter. I trust your hunting life is prospering in Elgato. Kagero, 
a Wolverian who runs a market in Kamura. I heard that Ron Dane's sister, Fjordine, was injured. Perhaps you have paid me a visit to ask about a certain someone, yes? Dr. Tadori is a dear friend of mine. He is one of the few who survived the destruction of my homeland. Since then, we have only spoken through letter. He is never in one place for very long and is often out procuring herbs for medicine. He had mentioned in a recent letter that he was on his way to the jungle. I think it is safe to assume that he is still there. Oh, and if you see Tadori, might I ask you to deliver a message for me? Her Highness is living a wonderful and fulfilling life in Kimura. Please visit sometime and try some of her delicious bunny dango. He'll know what this means. Forgive me, but I feel it would be better coming from you rather than a letter. We departed on a quest in search of Tadori in the jungle. We saw a monster, Astalos, lurking in the jungle. Fortunately, we were skilled enough to slay the monster and continue looking for Tadori. Well, greetings. My name is Tadori. A doctor specializing in flora and fauna. We made it back to Elgado together with Dr. Tadori. Tadori begins to share the medicine he could work on to cure Furin's wound and illness. Actually, the medicine I created back then will work perfectly for this situation. This poison afflicting Lady Fiorain now is precisely the same as that which once inflicted sufferers of the plague. It's not really a poison at all, it's a virus. A virus somewhat similar to another known as the Frenzy. Tadori explains, Furin's condition is similar to the virus known as the Frenzy. This virus was caused by the Magalas back in Monster Hunter 4. Tadori also explains how the curio seen today is unlike what they saw back then. Right, so the symbiosis with Malzino hadn't developed yet, and the juvenile curio preyed on humans instead of monsters. So that was what the plague really was, and why the virus ripped through the population like it did. Yes and no. See, humans are not a food source for the curio, so curio that couldn't coexist with Malzino died out naturally. Before Tadori left the meeting to work on the treatment for Fearing, he had a word for us about Kagero's important message. Ah, and one more thing, Master Hunter. Kagero's words that you relayed to me as we traveled here, they touched me very deeply. To know the young lady my master had entrusted to Kagero is safe and well, it's wonderful news. I left one day to gather herbs as usual, but while I was gone, my hometown was... I've never forgiven myself since. I did write to Kagero, but having failed my people by not protecting the village, I couldn't face him. But his kind words that you passed on gave me courage, and I can't thank you enough for that. <laughs> Forgive me. I must stop muttering and start making medicine, mustn't I? I'll let you know as soon as it's ready. They did fearing. She's okay. The medicine. Fearing. I'm sorry. I couldn't be here when the kingdom needed me. Erin! Oh. You're okay. All right, everyone. Time for the counterattack. Just in time, Pahari was able to locate Malzano's location and had planned to do a counterattack against the monster. Pahari, what's this about a counterattack? Have you located Malzano? You bet. Malzino set itself down in the Citadel. The Citadel? Ironic, huh? Occupying your old home, Admiral. The one it destroyed. Furin was surprised to learn that the Citadel was once Admiral Gallius's home. Bahari only knew about it because he had lived long enough to witness those times. After the unexpected revelation, Furin decided to join us on our quest to defeat Malzeno at the Citadel. Admiral Gallius gave the quest and we went ahead to meet with Chiche. 
She was glad to hear that the time has finally come to defeat Malzano after so many years. It's been the source of the kingdom suffering for so long. For that wicked creature to meet its demise has been the dearest wish of every being in the kingdom since its cursed arrival. Mother, I mean, Her Majesty. How she has longed for this day. A day where we no longer live in fear. And to think, we were making absolutely no progress at all until you arrived. Now, you've given everyone hope. Your fiery spirit has lit a flame in the people's hearts. The kingdom has faith in you. You must fulfill your duty. Those who let themselves be lured into the trap will be whisked away by a swift game, the embodiment of darkness. A darkness that does not let its victims go. As they are slowly drained of their life. The servants keep providing their master with vital essence. And once the time is ripe, the darkness will show itself, basking in moonlight. Under the crimson night sky, an eerie sensation was felt. It was different from the previous encounter we had with Luna Garen. There was an ominous pull, as if we were called to visit the ruined altar deep within the ruined castle. We wasted no time and ventured into the ruined fortress. In the heart of the ruined castle lies a collapsed temple. As we approach, the ruined temple's entrance. The menacing Elder Dragon appeared. Alzeno flew down from the sky and rested beside the glowing altar. Long ago, the people of Citadel frequently visit this very temple, offering prayers at the sacred altar. But as the time passed, this once hollowed ground was changed into a dangerous area within Citadel, attracting many of the powerful large monsters. There had been stories about this ruined temple. Those who dared to venture in this place have mentioned an eerie phenomenon. They've seen red souls swirling around the desolated altar. It was a spooky thought within the crumbling sanctuary. There's a belief among these swirling entities. They are said to be the tormented souls of those who died during the tragic events 50 years ago. However, this was disproven because in reality, behind the glowing altar lies the influence of the curio creatures. During the investigation of the disturbance that are linked into the arch demon of the abyss, more about that later on. Elgato's researchers revisited the altar and made an interesting discovery. They found out that Malzeno and a colony of Curios were nesting in the desolated temple. The Curio had turned the ruined sacred altar into their nesting ground. Over the years, the combined energy they and Malzeno had gathered has accumulated and formed a potent presence around that altar. These curio would empower Malzano, making the Elder Dragon stronger. The curious found all across the various location had all gathered in Citadel. The strong energy spread from the place acted as a powerful lure. The energy attracted many monsters to Citadel. Each one is driven by the desire to seize and harness that potent energy for themselves. From this moment, the altar had become a throne of darkness. Hunting Malzena was a tough challenge. The monster moves quickly, and its attacks are quite strong due to the curio creatures. 
These curios are small parasites that leech off the energy of other creatures. Once they latch back on Malzano, the Elder Dragon uses the collected energy for itself. While the curios feed on Malzano, some of their fluids known as the curio virus combine with Malzano's, which causes the monster to gather more strength. However, the energy given to Malzano would then be given back to the curios, granting these creatures to feed more on the monster. After it had gathered enough energy, the monster enters the bloodening state. Suddenly, the monster becomes much more aggressive and stronger than it was before. Some of Malzano's moves become so quick, it's almost as if it is teleporting. Eventually, the monster releases a powerful attack known as the Nightmare Cradle. Then, the monster releases itself from the bloodening state. Not long after, the monster would come to an end. After Malzeno had fallen, the Curios left the monster's body, leaving their host behind. They've lost their host, and now they flee. Or do they? After finishing the long-awaited fight against Malzeno, despite all the efforts that had been made, the team back at Elgado didn't experience a sense of victory just yet. You don't look particularly pleased, Bahari. I would have thought you'd be jumping for joy and doing cartwheels. I guess because there's still crazed monsters out there infected with the curio virus. As a scientist, I've got a lot on my mind. Malzino has been dealt with, yet there is still work to be done here. Mopping up the stragglers, investigating the effects of their migration, observing the curio. As we continued with the meeting, Admiral Gallius mentioned something about a new ship they've been working on. Bahari, a report on the new ship if you would. The weapons are giving me trouble. They're just too heavy. That much weight slows the whole thing down. It's kind of one or the other. Really? Can you let one go, Admiral? While the two were busy discussing about the new ship, Fiorain was surprised to overhear their conversation. Hold on a minute. A new ship, Admiral? Are we talking about the ship being built in the capital, sir? But with Malzino gone, the threat is behind us. At least, I thought so. Why the urgency to build a ship now? While Fiorin was confused about what was happening, Admiral Gallius explained the situation to her. Fiorin, the new ship is being built on my orders, with the Kingdom's permission, obviously. And as you suspected, there's more to it than meets the eye. But the fewer people I can involve in it, the better. Be patient for now. When the time comes, you'll know everything. Fiorin had many questions on her mind. However, she decides to trust the Admiral's decision instead. After some time, Bahari set up a meeting again to talk about his new observations on the Curio after they had lost their host, Malzano. The Curio are acting strange. With their host gone, they've lost their food source. So me and the other researchers figured it was only a matter of time before they'd all die out. What's strange about the Curio? Well, it's like they're getting excited. Sure, they're slowly weakening without their host, but they seem happy? Like children that were praised by their parents. That is strange. These quiet days would come to an end. The skies had turned cloudy, almost as if something big was about to happen. During the meeting, Admiral Gallius shared Dr. Tadori's report on the Angina that got attacked by Curio. Everyone was surprised to hear this and started coming up with ideas as to why it happened. Bahari theorizes the Curio doesn't need a host to survive, such as Malzano. If they didn't need a host to survive, then they didn't need Malzino. 
The second idea is more plausible. But then, who's the new host? Surely not another Molzino. There'd be another crater if that were the case. And there's no reports of the sort. More and more questions kept coming, despite slaying Molzano, and the curios continued to thrive. Because of this anomaly, the investigation on the curios went on. Not long after, a new report came up. They've noticed how a lot of the curios are gathering at the Citadel again. The Citadel? Again? It's as if that place is cursed. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean... Please forgive me, Admiral. I've insulted your home. Forget it. My old home may very well be cursed. Cursed by the Archdemon of the Abyss. The Archdemon of the Abyss. There was an old fairy tale in the kingdom's history known as the Wandering Flames. A fairy tale that is said to feed the Archdemon of the Abyss. A legend passed down across the kingdom. An old story about a demon lurking deep underground, waiting for its time. Whenever people's hearts are consumed by darkness, the demon emerges to wipe them out. After Furin had finished pondering about the fairy tale, we headed back to Citadel to figure out the strange gathering of the curio creatures. As we landed at Citadel, the atmosphere felt different. It was daytime. However, unlike the vibrant skies we have seen before, the skies were mudded with dark clouds, and small curios could be seen floating in the air. After we have stocked up our supplies and ventured out the campsite, we began to notice the lack of presence of endemic life in the area. The small monsters we have seen were lifelessly on the ground. As we continued to explore the vast array of environments in Citadel, large monster corpses could be seen scattered across the map. It was unnerving to witness how lifeless the place had become. Just as things were about to get creepy, we have reached the frozen mountains. A suspicious monster was standing from the distance. One of the three lords, Luna Garen, was lurking in the cold area. However, the monster's body is infested with the small curio creatures, causing it to act differently. After a long hunt in Citadel, the monster, Luna Garen, fell into the ground, and the curios flew away from its body. We headed back to the camp to meet up with the rest of the group. While we were on the camp, Fury noticed the curio creatures were all heading towards the ruined structure. Suddenly, a strong earthquake had happened, and the entire ruined structure collapsed. A large hole opened up and a powerful roar was heard. Afterwards, a large monster crawled out of the abyss and caught everyone by surprise. Fortunately, Admiral Gallius and the rest of the group came in and brought a large boat equipped with strong Dragonators. They fought the beast, shooting three Dragonators back to back. Then. The large monster fell back into the abyss. Back at Elgado, Furin asked Admiral Gallius about the ship they've bought on the battle. Admiral Gallius explains to Furin that it's the ship they've been working on for a while, together with the people of Komura. Furin had shown her appreciation. Then, she asked about the giant monster they saw back in the citadel. The Archdemon of the Abyss. Ages ago, people in the kingdom reported a ferocious bellowing coming from deep beneath them. 
That's where the story started. Back then, the Admiral was a boy. His home, the place we call the Citadel today, was attacked by Malzino. People heard those same bellowing sounds then too, right Admiral? Rising up from the bowels of the earth. As the rumbling proceeded, Malzino circled above, as if waiting for something. No link was proven, but in my mind, I was sure that the Archdemon was real, and that it was connected to Malzano. So when I became Admiral, I told Her Majesty and Bahari, and I ordered the ship's construction. Long ago, there was a powerful monster named Geismagorm hiding underground together with the small creatures called Curio. It wasn't known by the guild until the recent events in Citadel. This large monster had a fierce rivalry with another monster named Malzano. These two monsters would clash with each other, causing a great calamity that had impacted the kingdom. Fifty years later, a similar catastrophe happened within the other territory of the kingdom, Citadel. It was a tragedy. The people living in Citadel experienced a curio outbreak, in other words, an anomaly, causing countless monsters in the area to be aggressive, resulting in the downfall of the city. Despite how it all happened 50 years ago, the anomaly still plagued Citadel and the kingdom. They've set out ships to observe the locale, observing any strange phenomenon that could happen in the place again. Some people who managed to survive live to tell the story this very day. At a young age, Master Arlo and Admiral Gallius used to live in the Citadel. They knew how great Citadel was before. A few years later, as they grow old, they began to serve the kingdom as noble knights. Many young generation of knights came along to Elgado and shared the same goal with the two. Everyone had a strong sense of duty, a goal of slaying Malzeno and the monsters, not but the least to protect the people of the kingdom. Everyone in the kingdom will never forget about the citadel. While having a conversation back at Elgado, Bahari had shared the mysterious craters were not only made by Malzano's actions, but rather they were created by the monster Geismagorm, the monster Malzano. Whenever it sensed anything strange in its territory, the monster would become active to explore the area. After the first giant turf war between Geismagorm and Malzano, the archdemon severely injured itself. Because of this, the monster decided to retreat underground. In its weakened state, Geismagorm created small openings across its territory and sent out Curios to collect the energy it needed for its recovery. Geismagorm decided to stay underground and relocate itself to Citadel, seeking energy for its recovery. However, when Geismagorm tried to resurface, it didn't realize it was near the water. The hole it created was flooded and it prevented Geismagorm from climbing up. We can see this massive crater right next to Elgado. Since then, Geismagorm decided to relocate and hid under the citadel's ruins, the yawning abyss, for a few decades. Malzeno had noticed its presence and the monster took over citadel, waiting for Geismagorm to resurface from the ground again. Fast forward, after we had slain Malzeno, Geismagorm had finally gained the strength and courage to resurface back on the ground. Especially now, it had gathered more energy from the Curio creatures. If all that fiend finds its way back to the surface, we must take the ship to the crater and finish it. This time for the last time. We'll destroy the dark evil under our feet and let light fill the kingdom once more. After gathering the supplies and sailed back to Citadel, we finally arrived at the massive crater of Geismagorm, the den of destruction, yawning abyss. Long ago, this massive structure was built by the people of Citadel. 
However, this giant structure wasn't completed due to the anomaly that had happened 50 years ago. The structure is shaped quite like a coliseum. Because of the reappearance of Geismogorm beneath the seabed, parts of the massive structure were destroyed and sunk underground. However, despite the destruction, we can still see the remains of the structure across Citadel. It's been shared that the yawning abyss symbolized peace and prosperity for the people of Citadel, constructed using the advanced technology. This place was their source of entertainment and a display of the kingdom's domination over the land. Researchers imagined that the yawning abyss is a large place that could hold many people, likely designed to be a viewing plaza for the residents of Citadel. Despite the destruction, the kingdom plans to recover and rebuild the Citadel, including the Yawning Abyss. Once the threat of the monsters go down, the hope that, someday, the sun will shine on the Yawning Abyss again, bringing back its former glory. Meanwhile, outside the Abyss, we could hear the strong roar of Geismogorm. With no time to spare, we descended into the abyss to face the large monster. The battle between the archdemon was tough. Along the way, our team managed to shoot another Dragonator, directly hitting Geismogorm's body and causing it to fall. Soon enough, we pushed Geismogorm even further into the abyss. As it fell, many curio creatures descended to save their true host. As we have reached the depths, Geismogorm rose and transformed into a fearsome demon. In the middle of the hunt, the monster attempted to climb back up the abyss. The team dropped revolving ballistas from the air, using them to shoot down Geismogorm. The monster fought back by releasing a powerful wave of curio energy. Then, it fell back into the place. Later in the hunt, Geismogorm became fully enraged and it tried to resurface back to the abyss. Fearane didn't hold back, she wirebugged from the air, slashed her blade on the archdemon's back, causing it to fall once more. After a while, Geismogorm finally went to rest, marking the end of the countless years of destruction. After we have defeated Geismogorm, Many of the curios died. However, some of them have escaped, evolved, and tried to find their new host. These curios kept attacking monsters, trying to form a symbiotic relationship with their victims. Some of the creatures continued to reproduce because of the cursed altar inside the temple of Citadel. While we continued on our quest, hunting down monsters afflicted by these parasites. After some time, Admiral Gallius had received some news from the Chevaliers. They have sighted a new variant of Malzano lurking on Citadel. I received an urgent message. The Chevaliers have sighted a new variant of Malzano, and it's already causing chaos and destruction all across the kingdom. Furane was frustrated to hear the news. Meanwhile, Bahari had noticed the new variant of Malzano wasn't affected by the Curios. Indeed, thus we have decided to name this variant Primordial Malzano, as if it has traveled through time from the Primordial Era to the present. It possesses an even greater threat than Geismagorm. Furin contemplates on how Primordial Malzano could be even more dangerous than Geismagorm without the Curios. The Chevaliers found some records that paint a pretty clear picture of what we're dealing with here. Remember the Archdemon of the Abyss fairy tale? We thought we knew how it ended, but those records continue the story. Previously, we thought it ended with, when people's hearts are filled with darkness, it will surface to destroy them, right? But it actually continues with, the Archdemon will summon the Demon Lord, whose silver spear shall deliver its judgment, purifying the land until only ashes remain. It's common for tales like these to change over the course of time, but I don't like the sound of this Demon Lord thing. 
Bahari continues to share the findings of the Chevaliers related to the variant of Malzano. While Furian and Bahari were busy analyzing the given records, Admiral Gallius shared a short message from the Queen of the Kingdom. Brave hunter and vanquisher of the Archdemon, I call upon you once more to lend us your strength. To honor the Queen's request, we took on the urgent quest from Princess Chiche and sailed off to Citadel to face the monster. As we set foot on Citadel, outside our camp, the atmosphere is a little different than usual. The skies were cloudy and the land was filled with fog. As we explored the frozen mountains, the mysterious monster was waiting. The legend resurrected, Primordial Malzeno is lurking in the area. Unlike the first Malzeno we fought, this monster looked different. Its body is bulkier, armored, and has the appearance of a knight than a lean, sinister-looking Dracula. Despite the intimidating look of the monster, we engaged in a battle. Halfway through the fight, while the monster was distracted, curio creatures began to gather and latch on to Malzeno. As the curio creatures latched on to its body, Primordial Milzeno suddenly became aggressive. The monster began to attack like the Malzeno we have encountered before. However, it was just the beginning. As the hunt went on, many curios latched onto the monster, slowly transforming into an unrecognizable demonic state. The monster is filled with power and rage with the power it had gotten from the curios. Its body darkens and its wings began to glow. The monster's moves were quicker than ever and bursts of curio energy were released all over the place. It wasn't like any other monster we had faced before. Fortunately, after dealing enough damage, the monster weakened and retreated to the ruined temple. We rushed inside the ruined temple to not let the monster escape. As we made it inside the ruined temple, Furane noticed something. Something's off. And everyone important to me were laid to waste by Malzina. But this time, our true adversary is not Malzino. Our target lies elsewhere. We must destroy the Curio. After slaying the Curios, Primordial Malzano stood up peacefully in front of us. As the golden light illuminated the monster. It stretched its magnificent wings and left the locale. Primordial Malzeno, the true form of Malzeno before it was afflicted by the Curios. So it turns out, Malzeno repelled the Archdemon and it was actually protecting the kingdom the whole time. People from the past must have viewed him as some kind of savior, so they made that tale out of reverence and respect. Many years ago, Malzeno lived in harmony with the humans of the kingdom. Malzeno stayed to itself, and the people never bothered the monster. Both sides respected each other's space, so there was no conflict between the two. However, this would all have changed after the appearance of Geismogorm hundreds of years ago. Primordial Malzeno saw Geismogorm as a threat to its territory and it attacked the Archdemon. After a while, Geismogorm was brought back down to the Abyss, and Malzeno was slowly afflicted by the Curio. Over the years, Malzeno was slowly consumed by the Curio creatures. Eventually, 
This made Mount Zeno aggressive, and it led to the destruction of the kingdom's territory and the spread of the Curios Plague, or rather, the Anomaly. The recent reappearance of Primordial Malzeno was due to the presence of the Curio creatures. The monster wanted to defeat the Curios while it was desperately searching for its new host. After Geismagorm was slain, Primordial Malzeno wanted to eradicate the Curios and purify the land. I must thank you again, Hunter. Your heroism has once again saved our kingdom. Her Majesty is extremely pleased as well. I've been told she's writing you a thank you letter as we speak. She even said she wants to give it to you in person. And with everything you've done, I imagine that's going to be one long letter. I cannot count how many times I've told you this already, but thank you. As long as you're here, we shall overcome anything. The kingdom still needs you. We all do, of course, myself included. We may be at peace now, but who knows how long it will last. Please, would you not consider staying here? The story of the kingdom ends with a heartwarming gratitude and an invitation to stay to continue with our heroic efforts. Thanks for watching. It's been a long time since I've made this kind of storytelling videos and I wanted to share the story of one of many fallen kingdoms in Monster Hunter in the best way that I can. You can expect more stories like these in the future. Huge thanks to these people who made this video possible, Bandino for allowing me to use his translated notes for reference, Jaycan for voicing Master Arlo, Scourge Skull for voicing Master Utsushi, Bibake for voicing Kagero, Frost Dragonheart for voicing Tadori. The same goes with the rest of the amazing voice actors that I'll be linking in the video description. Also, I would like to thank you guys because your views on my previous videos helped me reinvest the earnings and make these kinds of videos possible. Feel free to subscribe to my channel. I have a lot of videos in my backlog that I have yet to release sometime this year before Monster Hunter Wilds. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.